Hey everyone, welcome to our next Florida Atlantic University webinar. Uh, we're trying to do a series during the pandemic on various topics, and the topics thus far have been related to operational challenges. In this series of questions that I received from all 9,000 plus of you, the trends are more um, still related to operations, but they're varying out a little bit as travelers too because a lot of you are starting to travel wherever you're located. Uh, we had several questions from Europe and Australia this time, several from the west coast of the U.S., and of course a preponderance from Florida, um, and they vary. So I will rotate around our great panelists. You saw our flyer with their companies and titles. Uh, I'll have them introduce themselves when we call on them for a question, but feel free to connect with them on LinkedIn, uh, visit their destinations, utilize their properties, eat in their restaurants, and so on, because these are the people who they really um, step forward whenever we ask. And I can tell you from my personal experience that about 50 people step up every time in our community to be a panelist. So it shows how much we want to help the world at large and how much we want to engage with the community. So welcome to everyone today. My uh, questions are in no particular order or rhyme or reason, but I'm going to start with one that is uh, probably good for Stacy and maybe one of the hoteliers because it says, I'll be traveling to Florida soon and once I'm within Florida, I want to take advantage of the great sunshine state. Uh, Fort Lauderdale's always been my preferred place to start and end. I really like it there. But I'm concerned during COVID about being a difficult guest. I want to ask at check-in for fresh linen, and I don't want to come off the, with the impression of being difficult. Can the Greater Fort Lauderdale CVV or the hotels give me recommendations on how to act like a good guest during COVID? I like this question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thanks, Peter. <clears throat> Thrilled to be uh, the first question out of the box. Thanks a lot for that. You're um, welcome. I'm Stacey Ritter, uh, President and CEO of the Greater Fort Lauderdale Convention and Visitors Bureau. It's actually a good question. First of all, even in whatever was normal before uh, before COVID, our hotels were more than capable of taking care of difficult guests. I just think that the, probably the asks have changed since six, six or eight months ago. Um, so the answer to the question is yes. The hotels have become more than accommodating to people uh, with particular needs or wants during COVID. And I don't think that there's a single ask that's unusual these days, whether it's not having housekeeping or having housekeeping. Uh, not having the coffee maker in the room or having the coffee maker in the room, not having the remote control in the room or changing your mind you know, and using the, your, your phone instead or, or having the remote control. Wow. There is no such thing as a difficult guest anymore. And despite what's, um, despite unfortunately how Florida has been in the news lately, there's, there's no question that here in Greater Port Lauderdale, Broward County, people are following the rules. We're taking this very, very seriously. And as a result, you'll see that our trend lines have continued to decline over the past 14 days. And we're very excited about that. That's good. And uh, are you getting the same types of questions from event planners as well? Like, what can I do? What can I do? Where should I go? The same thing as well as leisure? Oh, absolutely. Although event planning, the whole group conference um, department has really slowed down significantly, not just because of COVID, but because our the Broward County Convention Center is closed for renovations. It won't open again until the end of October 21. In fact, I can truthfully say that we haven't lost any convention business because of COVID, uh, but that's because our convention center shut down in February. Um, we, had, we had a crystal ball and said, yes, what a good time to shut down. Let's do this during what, what will be a pandemic. Um, it was just fortuitous that we were closed during it. So yeah, we're, we're getting the same questions. And again, there is no, you know, th there's no hard question. There's no difficult question. There's no question that hasn't been asked by somebody along the way. And we're used to answering those questions now. I don't think any of us could have anticipated that in the middle of August, we'd still be where we are. We all thought back in March that this would be a couple of months and we would get through it. It's taken a lot longer, but as a result, we've become more accustomed to dealing with those concerns that both leisure and group guests have about how to be safe and clean. And as a result, Visit Lauderdale has created a safe and clean 
program which any business can sign up for here in Broward County. You get a poster and it, and it shows that you're taking the commitment to safety seriously and it's just an extra added layer for your guests to feel that they are in fact safe and secure here. Excellent. Thank you. Let me um, ask that same question of Tom. Tom's with Embassy Suites in Las Vegas, part of the Hilton brand. And uh, Stuart on our panel, Stu is also uh, part of, will be part when his hotel opens of Hilton with Curio. Hilton's taken a brave step forward with their safe and clean um, activities. Uh, Tom, do you want to talk to that at all, like in terms of this guest question? Sure, sure. So, you know, the Hilton clean stay is obviously uh, the big focus right now, priority to, you know, using the Lysol products and sealing a room once it's completely cleaned and sanitized. And, uh, you know, prior to the clean stay coming out, our own organization, Remington Hotels, had rolled out a pretty stringent um, cleanliness and sanitation uh, of the guest rooms and public areas, and we you know, we really do this religiously hourly checklist that we're uh, sanitizing all hard surfaces, all high contact areas. And, you know, to, to answer the question or to comment about uh, difficult questions from guests, you know, really it's a, it's a different guest right now for, for my hotel than normal because we're so dependent on conventions in Las Vegas and everything has been canceled even into Q1 now. Conventions have canceled. But, you know, people coming in that are, you know, either uh, trying to do a little staycation or just overnighting on their way between Arizona and California will stay over. And a lot of similar questions asking, you know, can I have a room that hasn't been occupied for a long time? and asking for, you know, the, the fresh linens. It's, it's a, lot more, uh, a lot more requests for these things than before. And I will say that the guest is certainly, uh, you know, the cleanliness of a room has always been, you know, top of mind for a hotel guest, but they are examining the, the rooms in the hotel space uh, with a magnifying glass these days. So it's, it's been challenging, but we're, you know, we're meeting the, you know, we're meeting the, uh, the goal. So interesting you comment on that because anyone who asks me, I tell them this is the safest and best time I've ever stayed in a hotel. It's that we always focused on cleanliness and security and now we're super focused on cleanliness. So I feel like any room I enter is going to be far, I have a far better chance of it being spotless right now. So I, I agree with you on that. I'm going to, um, w along those lines, one of the questions um, that came up frequently was, I am either completely for paying a COVID surcharge to make sure my restaurant, bar, nightclub, meeting center is clean, or when do I start paying for all these great things that you're doing? Because it's going to come one way or the other as a cost. So I don't know. You know, let me let me talk. Joe, welcome to the group. I hope you can hear us okay. Yes. All right, perfect. So let me talk on the meetings and events side because this question has come up more from meeting planners. And, you know, you're at a, at a well-known destination management company, 360 the destination management group. So are you hearing what are the planners? Do they look to build in costs? Are they expecting them? Are they expecting the cheapest deals right now just to lure them back? What's the common theme you're hearing in the in the events world? Well it's a million dollar question. Um, <laughs> it's uh, it's gonna cost more. I mean that that's truly um, we just did an event in Orlando this weekend where we sat, uh, we had a very large group, um, it's the first group we've actually operated um, in five months. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm laughing because the whole time I thought it was going to cancel, um, like even at the pre-con on right. Tuesday, this week, I thought there's no way this is going to happen just because there's no confidence, you know, like there's just been so much cancellation, so much disruption. But, you know, we set 40% above what their count was for social distancing. Okay. And um, when we did that, um, we had more linens, we had more centerpieces, and we had, had more chair covers. And so it is going to cost more. Um, I think that's the struggle that a lot of people are, you know, um, it costs more money to, and more labor to do some of these things. And so 
we have been very uh, transparent with clients about that um, because ultimately it's their budget. Um, right. And if they're going to come meet, we're not filling a motor coach or a ballroom with the normal space. Right. So, um, and so those things I think need to be accounted for, need to be talked about and discussed with the clients. Um, but ultimately it's going to cost more. And I think that may be also limiting um, people's uh, decision. In this case, it was interesting because even though we set more, they did have less attendees. So it kind of worked out, if you will. There were okay. some people who just didn't. But um, I think realistically on the hotel side too, I, 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 you know, I saw the hotel uh, with more labor, more staff, because they were sanitizing the table, you know, the tables and chairs after use. And when we were turning the room, that took a little bit more time and a lot more labor. Right. And I, I understand. And I would say it's probably, if I were to guess, 80-20 in favor of knowing I'm going to pay more up front and I want it right now, but wondering for the long term. You know, let, let me go over to Bonnie, since she does events as well with Cafe La Card. Talk about any events that you have done in these same issues. Do you have to charge more because you need two people at the coffee cart instead of one? And uh, give us some, some thoughts from your perspective. Well, thank you for having me, Peter. I'm very, very happy to be here with everyone. Uh, my name is Bonnie. I'm the owner of Cafe a la Carte. And I have sat on the South Florida NAICS board for the past 15 years. I'm an immediate past president. And I also sit on the national board for the Live Events Coalition. Um, to answer your question, um, we have been doing um, numerous events at hospitals, at nursing care facilities, and locations with first responders um, in ways of thanking them for their service. So mm -hmm. we have gone after revenue that way, which we've been very successful. These were all our clients previously, but it's something that their staff has always enjoyed having our services. We have created, um, originally when we were working in the hotel, in the uh, hospitals, we created a social distancing component where we were taking orders through social media so that none of our, none of the hospital staff had to um, come into contact with our staff. And we were set up outside of the outside of the hospitals as opposed to being set up inside of the hospitals. We are following very strict CDC guidelines. So in front of our carts, we placed a plexi. Um, so there's no face-to-face -face contact with any of the guests or any of the um, staff. And all of our staff are wearing gloves and wearing masks. Um, uh -huh. Yes, we... How creative. That's yes. super creative. I mean, you could, you could translate that to a conference where the attendees could pre-order. You could do anything like that. But, you know, one of the questions coming up is about what niche areas are you exploring? And first responders, that's a great area because, you know, they're busy, unfortunately, but they're busy. So yes. interesting, interesting. All right, the, the next one... Um, I'm going to shift to, we have two, two gentlemen in our panel who are both opening new hotels within very short time, Stu and Carlos. And one of the questions applies to everyone here, but in particular, I'm wondering what you're doing with a building that isn't open yet. Um, what changes are your panelists doing in terms of advertising, marketing, and digital marketing right now? It's a fluid situation to move your budgets. And I'd like to see what everyone is doing, especially those who don't have a property open yet. So, uh, Carlos, you're first on my screen. So let me ask you that first. Sure. Thank you, Peter. Great to be on the panel and see so many familiar faces. Uh, really exciting. I will tell you that this really has started since March, especially I'm in Miami Beach for Highgate Hotels. And we have several open hotels. And then we have a couple that are up and coming as well, including the one I'm sitting at, the Washington Park. It's something that we really have spent a lot of time on looking at, and it really boils down to the communication with the future guests. And really, a lot of what was talked about, I heard Stacy reference it beautifully, Tom as well, um, is that at the end of the day, our industry has changed, but we feel very optimistic at Highgate that it's changed for the better. We manage Marriott's. We have two Hiltons on the beach that we manage, the Hilton Cabana as well as the Gates by Doubletree. And we feel that the fact that we partnered very quickly with the American Hotel Lodging Association 
in terms of the stay safe programs, safe stay, et cetera. So we're using that in our marketing and we're having a conversation. At the end of the day, we're looking to be transparent with our customers and let them know our program at Highgate and every company has it a little bit differently is called Be Well, Stay Well. And every component, it's things like one of the changes that we see that's going to be here for a while is your room is your room. We're going to put a seal on that. And then when you come in, it's your room. Now, having said that, it, like Stacy was saying earlier, if you order towels, we're going to bring the towels. We're probably going to knock, leave them in a bag, and you can have them that way. But at the end of the day, we're targeting our marketing efforts and everything that we do as it relates to really what's going on today, which is making sure that our unique spirit of service still shines, but also being diligent and very uh, really almost fanatical about making sure that it's a safe environment and a friendly environment within the changes, right? People wearing masks, we're hospitable. So especially in South Florida, we're used to hugging our kids. So that has inextricably changed. And we're spending a lot of time making sure that we're balancing that bridge between that spirit of hospitality and genuineness and warmth and the safety protocols and the different things that we have to put in place, whether it be plexiglass at the front office, whether it be contactless technology like digital key, et cetera, all those things. So it's a fine line, but we're marketing against we're here, we're safe, we want you here because we know people's human nature will be to get out and celebrate special events to the meetings business. It's all going to come back. A question is when. So we're really focused on our core messaging, which is around those values of be well, stay well, and we're in this together. That sense of community, which is one of our core values at Highgate anyway, that sense of community, that we're all in this now globally really together. Okay. So you're focusing on communicating that more than the features and benefits of the property per se or things we would have done before. Stu, how, how about you at, as you open Hotel Marin, part of Curio Collection? What, what are you doing initially different with with marketing advertising than you th would have thought six months ago? Yeah, well, uh, first of all, I want to thank you, Peter, for putting this together and my esteemed colleagues. And I think uh, Carlos and myself uh, share the same challenges. Uh, luckily, we're part of the Hilton chain, which, again, to piggyback on what Tom said, um, Clean State Program is great. And Hilton is promoting that globally. Uh, so it's a, a safe environment. I mean, wherever you go, we're going to have Everything, everything for everybody, right? Who doesn't carry sanitizer and masks from now? So um, right now, um, as we look to open in eight weeks, again, my name is Stuart Levy. Uh, uh, it's, the hotel is going to be the first curio in Broward County. Um, and we are, um, the full name of the hotel is Hotel Marion for Lauderdale Beach Curio Collection by Hilton. Sorry, I forgot that part. <laughs> um, so we are going to be a, uh, I guess that's important, right? We're going to be uh, the first upscale hotel on the beach in a while now, so we're really, really excited. Thanks, um, But, uh, you know, Hilton Brand is, is doing a great job promoting this globally. Uh, right now, as we look to open in eight weeks, we're focusing on the drive market because okay. not many people are, are flying right now, so they're, they're still a little afraid. So most of the business that's coming to the beach now is um, Miami, Palm Beach, even Fort Lauderdale. Okay. So the weekends, the weekends are really, really starting to pick up. Um, the results in the past few weeks have been great. Um, our market showing 50%. Some hotels are doing 70%. Um, Excellent. But I think our challenge right now is getting weekday business back, getting group business back, uh, especially in a brand new hotel. But yeah. as far as marketing. Marketing business as usual with the added, you know, with the added safety precautions. Okay. We are still targeting the same people we would have targeted if, uh, you know, if COVID never happened, and we're going to continue to do so because it's it's not going to be around forever. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let me uh, shift a little bit to uh, HR, and we'll go to Leone. Hello, in the middle. You're on my middle square there. So, so we're going to talk about HR a little bit, and then I'm going to share ask this with Kate because Kate at Margaritaville has always had a very associate-focused, extremely positive culture when I interact with any one of her team members. So some of the questions led to, uh, the first one for you, Leone, is are, do you think there's going to be a long-term change in how we train going forward? Like, will this be the new normal for room attendants and the new normal for front office staff? 
What's your thoughts on that? Well, thank you, Peter. And again, um, I'm happy to join this wonderful team of individuals. And um, my name is Leonie Timothy. I'm with the Intercontinental Miami. And we're a part of the IAG team. And I do believe that there will be some changes. But uh, going back on the original question that you asked, where the uh, individual from London asked about changing the sheets and so on, IAG already has a program, which is IAG Way of Clean which is already complete, is thorough. And we, what we've done is we have updated it where we include changing the sheets every day or cleaning the door <coughs> knobs, focusing on those little things. So those are some, uh, some, some key things that, components that we are going to add and we're going to maintain going forward in the way that we train and we uh, clean our property. So, um, also trying to keep the the colleagues motivated and 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 uh, having them see the importance of this going forward once COVID has. Oh so yes, this will be a permanent change. And you know, I have to comment on that because we have very varied um, competing things right now going on. We have the pandemic. We had a movement toward a ballot here in Florida for raising minimum wage. We have our employees working more than ever and not really being able to hug each other, like Carlos mentioned. We're a hugging business. And so we're doing more working harder during a pandemic with issues at home. And we're probably working the hardest we have for the money. But most emails I got, the people are quite satisfied and happy to be working versus their furloughed friends. So I think it's too early to tell right now, you know? So Kate, how about you with all these changes? Do you see any of them at Margarita being permanent that you've really liked and said, hey, this is good? Or are they temporary in your mind? Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, and so thank you for having me again. Kate Cameron, General Manager at Margarita Bell Hollywood Beach Resort. And, um, you know, I do think some of the things that we have implemented um, will last and will have legacy as we continue to evolve in how we do business. Um, you know, take, for example, the, this, this panel virtual Zoom meeting. Um, we have found ways of doing business that are effective. Um, virtually, and um, and I think there's balance there for a lot of you know um, people who who want to work from home, who look to have the same connectivity and relationship with their peers, but to do it in um, from a remote environment. So I think that that will that will transcend just um, you know the immediate time of you know COVID precaution and training accordingly. Um, and I, and I think that. Um, We'll go back to some of the traditional ways of doing things, but um, in the hotel world, for example, um, we had to find really unique and innovative ways to communicate. Um, and technology has become so helpful and beneficial, and um, and I think that we'll continue to evolve in how we communicate and in multiple ways of communicating and getting messaging out. Mm, that's interesting, and it's funny, one of the questions was definitely about that, um, and if I blend them into some, some people felt that years ago when technology improved, live events were going to go away, and then we proved otherwise. People still want to be where the keynote speaker is for their beloved association or so on, and now we've moved virtual forcefully to another comfort level, but you're right, we're going to wind up somewhere in between infusing technology where it's useful and meeting live where we need to be. And it's just a matter of time. I don't know, Bonnie, since you're on the Live Events Coalition, you want to comment on that? Absolutely. So the Live Events Coalition basically was formed uh, about two weeks after coronavirus hit the industry, and we have been active in every aspect of advocacy and lobbying on behalf of the 12 million people in the live events industry. Um, many of the members of our coalition have pivoted and gone into virtual, but the main focus 
for us is the lobbying and advocacy and to show that not only we were the first to shut down, but we will be the last to reopen. Mm -hmm. So the coalition has been doing amazing, amazing work on behalf of our members and to bring attention and first and foremost educate the legislators on what we do, how we do it, how we meet, and, and the impact that the live events industry as a whole affects the GDP. So we've been really, really focused on educating the legislators. They know how to show up to the galas and the fundraisers, but sometimes they think that just genie in a bottle creates that because we're all behind the scenes. And so now it's time for everybody that's behind the scenes to come out from behind the screen and be shown, be seen, and to be heard. So Great. that's what we're working hard on. Wow. Um, you know, I, I'm going to come back to Stacy because there were so many positive comments about destination marketing and questions. And listening to all of you, you know, it's like Kate said, it's very nice that I see all my friends in one place that we're all so busy we don't get together. I haven't seen Stacy in person in ages. I haven't seen Carlos in ages. I haven't seen Kate in ages. And here we are. So it's nice to have a conversation, even though I can't give you a hug, you're here. And one of the things that came up is I like bringing my, my groups to Fort Lauderdale because I feel warm and fuzzy there. Um, <laughs> as an event planner, I really want to accelerate my bookings, and I'm having a hard time with my clients. Is the DMO there? Do they have any suggestions? on how I can motivate my clients to feel safer. I don't know, Stacey, if you want to comment on that. That's a good question. And, and first of all, Peter, I want, to, I want to let you know that I have seen you. I took your certification class a couple of months ago. So while you couldn't see me, I could see you. And it thank was you. nice to see you. It was a great class, by the oh way. Oh, my God, thank you. It was a great class. <laughs> One of the, what, tens of thousands who took it? Yeah, we had was... uh, like 77,000 registered, 60,000 wow. actually entered, and almost 45,000 completed. So just crazy That's... numbers, crazy. Congratulations. Thank well, congratulations. you, thank It was you. a great thing to do. <laughs> Um, look, meeting planning has been difficult. We've had groups cancel left and right. We have people who are hesitant to ink a contract because no one knows what's happening. No one, tomorrow is going to be different than today, and, and yesterday is different than today. Also, nobody knows. But I will tell you that, um, again, the fact that Convention Center is closed has helped us, but we are selling for 22, 23, 24, 25 and out. And as we build the 800 room Omni Hotel, at the convention center for the first time ever. We know that business will come back, but it, it's going to be very difficult to get people willing to do that until there are therapeutics or a vaccine. And, and it's a ter it, I hate to say it. Look, we all want to get out on the road. I've been on an airplane since February. Mm. Uh, I never thought that I would be jonesing for even the middle seat, but um, <laughs> I really need to feel like I want to get back out there. But it, it it's a very soft sell right now. You have to be sensitive. You can't be tone deaf to, to, to what people are thinking and, and how they're feeling. And for us, we aren't marketing to the same group that we would be marketing to right now. We're not marketing to the Northeast right now. Um, those people come here, they go home, they have to self-quarantine for two weeks. Right. That means if you get a one-week vacation, you actually have to take three weeks off because Florida has become a pariah, Right. Um, not just nationally but internationally. It's, it's been devastating, as you know, for the industry. So it's a different kind of marketing, whether it's leisure or group, it's a different kind of marketing. But the positive news is that, as you know, group, group books so far out that people are still, we are still talking to our clients. We are regularly speaking to our clients. Some of our salespeople have come up with really imaginative things to do virtually or electronically, actually, during this time, whether it's yoga or meditation. We've got We've got virtual tours going on on, um, on Sunday.org where the hotel, our hotel partners are actually taking their, their phones with them and touring hotel, the touring property so that clients can see what's going on, uh, that we're still here, that we're still ready. And when they are ready, we are ready. Okay. But you, you can't hit people over the heads right now because we all have to recognize that there are, there is a, a, a serious hesitancy and a realistic one right. for traveling. 
It's funny because right under that question, I had a comment from a planner in Hawaii who said, yeah, actually she works at a DMC, and she said incentives don't work, cajoling doesn't work, it's transparent honesty like Carlos said. And she said my best efforts have been my own cell phone with my teenage son touring the island to show them what is reality, you know? Mm -hmm. Joe, well, let me know, it, Go ahead. It, 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 just briefly. Um, you, you really do have to be transparent. I, I've been on a uh, I've been on a couple of panels just this week, and um, some of my colleagues from other places in Florida have just wanted to talk about good news. And while we all are desperate and hungry for that little kernel of good news, the truth is that if you aren't transparent with your clients, you will lose trust. Absolutely. And so you just have to tell them how it is and hope that they trust that there will come a time when we are all ready to come to, to be back together again. You know, it's funny, It'll it's funny you say that because, as Carlos knows, I love to go to the Hard Rock. And on the last <laughs> panel, the COO of Hard Rock was on my panel. And they have a proprietary initiative called Safe and Sound, very similar to all these other initiatives. And I went very cautiously to the day they opened the, pro the first property in Tampa. And until I felt safe myself, I wasn't ready to play and enjoy myself. So this is, we're human. This is totally normal. And there is, this is no time to be tricking your guests with imagery and giving false information because, I mean, it, you, we have to think long term. So I'm right there with you. Would I love to say, yes, COVID is gone and I have a full class here listening to you? Of course I would, but that's not the reality. Um, Joe, I want to ask you over on the DMC side, along these same questions from incentives to meet and what Stacy said, are you having to redesign your contracts? Are you having to get rid of your contracts? I mean, what's going on on the contracting side? Peter, you're going to give me the contract? <laughs> um, I mean, all of us in the industry are laughing because um, I feel like I could probably go to law school today. Um, uh, you know, I've been educated on numerous. First of all, I do want to thank you for the class because I was one of those 40 something thousand. And, um, yeah, who cracked me up? And, you know, and, and, uh, what I love about what you've done, um, is you've, you've, you've done a great way of connecting with people in some cases. And I hate to tell you this, um, you, you kind of re-inspired me through that class to be like, oh, this is why I love this. I get it. That you was know? my goal, was to get us engaged during the crappiest time we've lived through. That's, that's right. exactly and, what my goal was. Right, and I think, you know, it's funny, I had this conversation with somebody yesterday because, you know, we did just operate a program last week, and I am giddy, but I'm not really talking about it, you know, because it's like you don't know, you want to be sensitive, and you want to uh, celebrate because it was a win. Don't get me wrong, this client wanted to meet came to meet and we're going to service them. But, okay. you know, but to get back to your question, you know, at 360, you know, we have 17 offices nationally and, you know, we have a bunch of offices in California here. I'm based in Florida. I'm actually right down the street from you um, there in Boca. But, you know, for me um, in California, there's 10 people or less can meet. I mean, so you think about the restrictions and some of the other stuff, this is going out to the world. I feel lucky that I am in Florida where, Yes, we're being smart about what we're doing, um, but we at least have an opportunity to service some customers or smaller groups or even the leisure guests, you know, in okay. some cases. But to get back to your question with the, um, yeah, the, the, I think the biggest struggle right now, and, I, and I'm also part of the a couple of different coalitions. I'm on the influence committee with an FICP, Financial Insurance Conference Professionals as well as IRF, the Incentive Research Foundation, and we've been doing a lot of calls on a lot of topics, and the, the, the um, and this topic of contracting has been probably, if it's not the first topic, it's the second one. And so I think the big thing right now is educating everybody on a force majeure and what is a force majeure. I think the hotels have been cr tremendously flexible in 2020 and allowed people to pick up, move. And we've actually followed a lot of the hotels lead. Um, but you know, what was, what's been challenging about, I think every single case is you can't, every case has its own story. Every case, every cancellation, every, you know, whatever has its own circumstances. When sure. did you cancel? Was the this in place? Whatever. What's happening now, I think, is a little bit more challenging because people have moved and now they're moving again. 
or we're asking to be, you know, we're, we're asking for different language to be put together from a force majeure standpoint when it's not, a force majeure is something that we're not sure is going to happen. We don't even know about. We're in a force majeure now, but future stuff wouldn't be considered a force majeure. So I think the, the interesting thing is, and I, I use this word loosely, but it really is on both sides. What's reasonable? Okay. What is it? What is termed as reasonable? We have a group that's moving from February to May. Now they want to insert new language, and I and I told them I said there's no pants cancellation, there's no penalty. But the moment we start inserting new language, we may have to choose this as a cancellation with a rebook because we're accepting new language that is ultimately may change the dynamics of the contract. Okay. And if you if you walk away in May, there's going to be cancellation charges that may not be here today. And I think okay. that's that. So. To get back to your question, um, I think everybody is interested in partnering. We're all hurting, but I think there is reasonable conversation that's needs to go on and, and, and responsibility and acceptance of um, some risk. And okay. in some cases, um, that's what we've been looking at. Um, we've all had cancellations, but I think, um, in my opinion, uh, the conversation starts. And then I think most clients that I've talked to, like we have not revised our force majeure um, clause okay. like we, we just have it yeah. um, and a lot of hotels have not either but i think what is happening or what will start to happen is there's going to be conversations about force majeures in the future and because you move during a force majeure would that carry over and in most right. cases i would say no because that's why we moved it um if you if that makes sense so it is a difficult conversation but i think the one thing to get back to the other question over communicating is the big thing that I think has changed in our industry that will not go away. Okay. I think I, there's over communication like of safety measures as well as just contracting and just getting out there in front of and educating our clients on what's happening. We uh, we have to do that with students regularly, um, you know, and there will be the one percent that say, "Hey, you know, I got it," but there's still the ninety-seven percent that I only saw that one time. So. I'm a big fan of over-communicating, and especially those of you in the audience watching, um, most destinations, most hotel companies, whether independent or brands, most restaurants, everybody is trying to have some type of safe and sound certification, whatever it's called in some way. You really need to do the due diligence as the guest or the planner to see where you're going and what that means for you, because there is variety. I've had questions asked me about who's policing these, how long are they in place for, is Hilton's better than uh, IHG's, is it better than Marriott's, and I'm like, you're the traveler, you need to know what your expectations are and read through the fine lines. That's all I can give you as, as advice. Um, the next one I like, it's, it's positive, and I think this is a positive outcome. Um, we did get several questions about people having the best applicants they've ever had when they do have an open position, as you would imagine. Stu is hiring for a new property, Carlos is hiring for a new property, and Leone works in HR. So I love this question. I returned to my job at the Brown Palace Hotel and Spa in Denver on Mother's Day weekend. I'm the spa supervisor. Um, I had the ability to hire a front desk agent and I had the most incredible interviews I've ever had. So the owner said, go ahead, I'll let you hire two. My question is, as a manager, now that we have these excellent prospects, how do you feel about making them in, come into the business now where we don't lose them to, the pan, she calls it pandemic fever. So getting them in the best that you found and then exposing them to a workplace that maybe not is our normal for hospitality. So, Leone, I'll throw that one to you. Yes, actually there are several components um, on that topic that I could address. Definitely when we have a, a, a new individual, we, we are in a different world right now. We know that they are carrying a major load right now at home and at work. We're um, giving them multiple tasks that they're, they're going to be completing, uh, tasks that are normally not part of that particular position. So uh, we have to be upfront, as you all mentioned before, be transparent with the team member, um, communicate, train them properly. And one of the things that I think that we shouldn't forget is reward and recognition. 
Um, in the age of trying to save money and reduce costs, we have whatever programs that we had in place prior that we need to maintain those programs. We may have to adjust them, but we need to maintain them. We also have to uh, continue things as, as far as uh, meetings, holding regular meetings with the team members, letting them know what's going on. Um, one of the things we still have in place with our team members, we have, uh, I, we call it iconic, but it's part of it's, uh, from a company called Beekeeper. So we maintain communication whether our employees are working or not. We have that resource where it's, it's a social media outlet where they're able to chat, add pictures, um, share messages, videos, and we let them know what the occupancy is, um, uh, who's in-house, um, birthdays that we're celebrating, anniversaries that we're celebrating. So we're maintaining those things. Um, this week I was part of a meeting where another property mentioned that uh, they coordinated a virtual um, town hall okay. for both the existing team and those who are not working. So maintaining those are, are very important right now and taking some time to listen to the team members and finding out uh, what they're going through both within the uh, organization and at home as well. And I think that's something that we need to do with both the, the ones who are working and those who are whether they're furloughed or laid off, maintaining that communication because we're going to want some of those individuals back as well. Yeah, so, and I, I agree. And by doing all of that, you're going to keep the fresh ones that are superstars because we're actually, like someone else said, over communicating with the, with the team <laughs> in a good way. Carlos, I mean, you're a little bit further from opening. Let me have Stu comment first because he's opening in a few weeks. Have you found that the applicants have been much better because of the pandemic and so many people out of work? What's your experience? Yeah, Peter, there, there's a ton of talent that's out there. You know, it, it's heartbreaking when this first hit and you, you get so many emails on LinkedIn and at these talented people that are out there. And, it, and it's really hard to choose because a lot of these positions, even when COVID's over, post-COVID, uh, they're not going to come back. So there is a lot of talent out there. And the most important part of it is that you're dealing with the public. You're face-to-face, -face, even though there's six feet apart, social distancing, masks. You're face to face. So the most important thing is to make them feel safe. So just like Leone said, it's all about training. Um, but there, there is, there's more talent than has ever been out there, and, and it's really heartbreaking because you can't fill all these jobs. Yeah. And so then, that is, right. is, I mean, that's the biggest challenge for an opening hotel right now. How to staff? Um, because you know we're we're going to be an upscale hotel, so we have to provide five star service. Um, but of course, we have to, you know, we owe it to our, our budget, which is going to be a challenge in itself to, um, you know, so it, it's a fine line there. But yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of people out there that are good people um, uh, that aren't going to find jobs. So you, you really have to sit through it and see who has local experience, uh, market experience. Yeah, um, much more, yeah, much more particular to what you need. It's, a, it's an opportunity we haven't had in a while. You know, Tom, yeah. I'm going to move back to you at Embassy listening to Stu about positions that may not come back. Some of the questions are along those lines. One of them was, you know, I've been a concierge for years. Um, I'm part of the prestigious group. I'm certified. I really think my profession will slowly erode or go away. Uh, pushed more forcefully because of the pandemic. Right now, everybody can ask Siri for anything. Um, so along those lines, Tom, what do you think are some other positions that won't come back or will be slow to come back? Well, it's, it's hard to predict the future, but you know, I think some of the support positions that have been you know, regular in hotels uh, may not come back because we just don't have the same uh, workload demand at this time. You know, for example, we've still got a good 60% of our staff is furloughed and, you know, a couple of positions were, you know, laid off or eliminated. And, you know, the, the market here with the casinos and the tens of thousands of people that are unemployed right now and furloughed, 
is is crazy. I've never seen anything like this with the amount of people that send resumes or emails, you know, looking for positions. And, you know, certainly as we do start to rehire and refill positions, uh, I think every position will have an opportunity to be upgraded with the with the folks that are out there looking for new positions. Okay. Yeah, I would agree with you. Um, when I lived uh, through the 9-11 recession in Orlando, I had never seen anything quite like it, and I'm sure that's what's going on in Vegas world right now as well. Carlos, let me ask you. I mean, you're getting ready to open soon. Are you finding good talent as well? What are your comments on this? Well, it's funny. And by the way, thank you again for what you're doing in the industry. I also took that course and <laughs> along with the 70,000 and it was wonderful. It definitely inspired me. I think Tom said that earlier as well. I think uh, tagging along to what Leonie, Tom and, and Stu talked about in this area, I think in my 37 years in this industry, I'll tell you that the talent pool has never been richer than it is today. That's, uh, uh, it's just, it's unbelievable in terms of talent. Now, having said that, in preparing for today, I weren't sure of the questions, but I knew because FAU, and I really started thinking about what job search advice would we have for students, which ties into also current job seekers. I think it's a combination of both. And I think you were onto it, Peter, when you asked Tom in terms of positions that might not come back. I'll take a different spin on it and say the fact that we believe very strongly that being patient and flexible, whether you're a student or someone with 10 years experience and really being passionate, innovative, and creative, relevant to, you're going to want to learn as much as you can about every position because right now we're being asked more than ever. Back when I started in 1981, we were we were doing checkouts only and cashing traveler's checks and cash. No, I'm dating myself, but it was very specific. And then you had front office clerks that just checked in people. That's all they did all day. Right Now, it really is incredibly important and essential really for the candidate to be able to vary their experience and learn as many areas as possible. So everyone becomes a concierge, Siri notwithstanding, right? Everyone has the ability to go on their phone or onto their computer at their desk or in front of a guest at a front office situation and become a concierge. Everyone has the opportunity to become a marketer. So it really is about varied experiences. And I think that's where we want to focus our attention. And the other thing I think on this is that this is where our leadership is really tested and tried and true in the sense that if we lead from a position of strength and from optimism, and I liked what Stacy said earlier in that we want to be optimistic yet realist. So we don't want to paint it like everything's great today, but we do want to set ourselves up for when it does come back and that starts today. So I'll right. tell you, I've been looking at my leadership and what I'm doing, and I'm doing this a long time. And every day I'm looking for a new way to engage that job seeker that really is coming into something that's vastly different than we've ever experienced. So I think it's about varying the experience, staying very positive yet very transparent, and I'll leave it with the last thing on it, which is Cy Sims when he sold clothing in the 1970s. He said something very interesting. An educated consumer is our best customer. So at the end of the day, an educated candidate becomes our best team member and associate. Yeah, I remember those commercials, and it's right, you know? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go up uh, to Bonnie and Kate on this one. And Bonnie, I'll start with you because you mentioned first responders. That's such a unique win that stands out in my mind. This question was, and I had many varieties of it, there's always a winner in every crisis. What's going on in hospitality that your panelists see is either making a big gain right now or poised to make a big gain? What, what do you think? So my answer to that would be anything virtual. I mean, we see everything right now. So many people that, you know, that are members of the Live Events Coalition are constantly promoting all of this um, virtual, um, virtual anything that they can provide to their clients to generate revenue, whether it's vir virtual games, virtual gatherings, virtual bingo, virtual anything. So I think a lot of, a, a lot of strength and a lot of um, power has been put forth in, in the virtual aspect right now. Um, as a person in the live events industry, we all know that that will never substitute ever for in, 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 pl in place meetings with each other, face-to-face -face meetings and gatherings, 
you know, that desire will never go away. And I think that the, the pent up angst that everybody has and the anxiety and the excitement that everybody has that wants to get back together and meet and be safe together, that will never go away. Okay. Kate, how about you? What do you see as a clear winner from this pandemic, if anything? Well, I think there's probably two, um, Peter. I think, you know, technology, which I spoke to previously, um, you know, there's so many ways that we are um, embracing and using technology across generations, um, much more than ever before. Um, people are comfortable with um, putting, you know, their phone up to a QR code and being able to look at a menu or an offering or um, or whatever um, to get more information. So I think um, that will continue, and that has been a strong winner. The other thing I think is a strong winner is sort of a back to the basics um, for leisure travel, uh, the embracing of, you know, enjoying nature, enjoying um, things that you can do as a family or you can do with your travel companion, um, enjoying all of the beauty that Florida, for example, has, our beaches, our trails, um, kayaking and in the mangroves. There's so many things that people have forgotten about or maybe not taken as much advantage of. And we've definitely um, saw a resurgence in that. And we see people really enjoying those amenities and those things that are really, you know, just very much a part of our everyday life. Wow, that's great. And, you, you know, saying that on my own social media, I've seen more families and friends and colleagues taking road trips with the kids than I have in a long time actually packing up, getting in the car, and, you know, the staycation regional travel, I'm always suggesting Fort Lauderdale because that's my favorite beach and my favorite place and where I grew up, but I'm always telling everybody, come to Hollywood, Fort Lauderdale, Miami, take a road trip, take a road trip, and for, finally people are actually road tripping. So I, I, I agree with you on that. It's maybe a reframing of family destinations or something that will come out of this long term. Um, I want to ask Tom this next question because it's from um, a Hilton front desk employee somewhere in, in the world. And um, she had said that a good part of her compensation historically has always been from upselling. And, you know, her brand always gave her the incentive to upsell and do things at her full service property. She's kind of lost as what to do to help guests during the pandemic. So she has shifted upselling to offering a variety of PPE packages that she's self-made. She's made four different designs of PPE equipment and the property is letting her upsell PPE equipment. So I think this is very creative. But she wanted our panelists to talk about upselling. You know, how, how are you even dealing with that in a crisis when there's really nothing to upsell? Like, you know, I guess the suites are still the upsell, but I'm, she's lost on what you're thinking as a hotelier. Well, it's interesting because uh, pre-COVID, you know, our, our hotel was very active with um, a company called FPG, and the front desk agents made a lot of money with upsells, everything from early check-ins to upgraded amenities in the, in the suites, and none of that is really... Uh, applicable right now because first of all I'm one of the front desk agents <laughs> most every day and uh, you know we've we've sort of suspended that uh, I I don't have a lot that I could uh, upsell currently uh, other than you know just going back to you know all of us being the concierge and you know recommending and suggesting things for the guests to do because Right now, most of most of my folks that are here are doing you know little staycations, a lot of locals, a lot of drive-in business, and you know once they get to Las Vegas and they realize that uh, everything is still not opened in the city as you know they thought, uh, just from not really doing the research before they you know before they made their trip. So it's it's challenging right now because I would love to have some some ideas on upsells to help generate some 
incremental revenue that that we're not able to get right now. Mm. Yeah, and she she had a lengthy email about you know going through the process, and they have to permit all agents to do it, and they had to make sure it was a safe and sealed products of the four choices. But it was very creative, and she said the guests actually like it because most of them come unprepared for what they really wanted to have and they most of them did a road trip and so they either go to the local CVS or Walgreens in her city or she has a prepackaged. I, I thought that was an ingenious idea but she was it so is. used to upselling as a career style you know yes um, thank you for that and next one for, for Stacy I live in Sydney Australia I love to come to Florida. We're planning our next trip. Um, I see you have someone from Greater Fort Lauderdale. I've always thought Fort Lauderdale is great. My question for your the leader there is, do you think secondary cities in Florida are where I should make my pathway this time? By secondary, I mean smaller and probably less issues with COVID. Or do you think major cities because they're better prepared? So poor Stacy gets the hard one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I probably have less experience in this industry than anybody on this panel. Um, first of all, I, having lived in um, Fort Lauderdale since 1974, I like to think of us as primary. Uh, that's first and foremost. And, um, and it is great here. It's an interesting question. Um, I think that we will have here in Greater Fort Lauderdale, and of course it's called Greater Fort Lauderdale because we are a Broward County agency and we have 31 municipalities that we market. Um, I think we're going to have an easier time bouncing back than large cities will because we are, we are, we are not dense. Um, density here is, has a completely different definition than it does in Miami or New York or San Francisco. Okay. Uh, you know, our, our tallest buildings aren't nearly as tall as you will find in, in really major cities here in, in the country. So I, and we have 23 miles of beaches uh, covering eight cities here in Broward County. So, and, and I think people are looking for that. I think people are looking for places right now where they can spread out where they know they can, that social distancing is not an issue. I, mean, I, I run the beach every day, and whether it's the morning or the evening, there are people on the beach, but they're not crowded. They're not on top of each other. They're not close together unless they're in a party. So I think we're going to have an easier time, and, and, and we are marketing and promoting the fact that you can spread out here, that we are an open-air destination 12 months of the year. Yes, it's hotter in the summertime, but... We're, Flo we're South Florida. We're hot. You know, we have two seasons, hot and hotter. So, um, <laughs> but we do market that. We believe that showing beautiful pictures of beautiful beaches with wide, empty spaces will be something that will allow us to bounce back quicker than okay. other places. Not only, not only here in Florida, but across the country. And she, and she saw Fort Lauderdale as her primary big city destination in her email because she listed out for me um, Ocala, Immokalee, Destin, <laughs> okay. some very, very <laughs> small cities. And I said, well, if you're coming from Australia and you want to stay in one place for a period of time, Immokalee probably doesn't have a, accommodations for you. So, but it was a very interesting email that she felt Fort Lauderdale to be open. But, um, you know, she sent me pictures also of people in other cities. New York was one, San Francisco was another, and Vegas was one. And she wants to come. She's afraid that they'll remove travel permissions before she can even book. So, she's, you know, travelers are weighing all these things in their head, whether they're, they're allowed well, you know, to come, you know? Being from Fort Lauderdale, um, I will, you know, we, those of us who live a little bit north of our county to the south, you know, that very large county, which shall not be spoken. We probably have a complex. <laughs> so it's funny. When it's... I said that I didn't think we were secondary, that's because I carry a Miami complex. Interesting. As do all of us who live, you know, all uh, of us yes. who live here in uh, You know what? In defense of Miami-Dade County. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Leone, See, this funny is what happens. Wonderful. This is what happens. We end up in this friendly competition. Yeah. So there no we offense go. to Miami. Always friendly. But we are better. <laughs> I love no my offense. panelists. I love my panelists. Peter, you, Peter, you got to take this to another uh, subject. I love it. <laughs> Car Carlos, Carlos and Stu, and um, I'll, I'll ask Kate this too because her property is still, in my mind, fairly new. 
What are you hearing about construction and design? Like, you know, people ask me about what about the permanent buffet setups and the large hotel conference rooms and convention rooms? Uh, are any of the changes going into your design? Like, you know, Stu, you're probably in Carlos too far along to change anything, but have you had these discussions? I'll, uh, Carlos, I'll start with you. Well, in my current capacity in, in the task force here at Washington Park, it was already an existing hotel, but I can speak to two hotels that we have coming up that we're opening in the area that are going to be the Salino on 6th and Ocean Drive, 640, the Old Park Central, and the Good Times, which is going to be on Washington Avenue and 6th um, in South Beach as well. And I can tell you that if you're certainly things are being looked at to retrofit some things and to put in some new realities relevant to the social distancing and making sure that Kate talked a lot about it, and I agree 100 percent with her on the technology side, making sure that the technological advances are ramped up even to a greater level, because that is where there's going to be winners. And that whoever embraces technology in the most creative and the most effective ways are going to reap the benefits going forward. And, and I'm talking now three years, five years down the road, but even immediately. So I think from a design and construction standpoint, I think there's also going to be a big focus. And Kate touched on this, and I love when she said it, the outdoors, nature. So outdoor spaces are taking on a whole different dimension now, whether it's on a pool deck, whether it's through a, um, an awning with a canopy area, et cetera. I think that this is where design and construction and spaces, architects are having, I'm sure, a very good time of this because they get very creative by nature. And I've seen, for instance, Garcia Stromberg up at the Boca Resort doing some things. I saw that on LinkedIn recently, and I marveled at some of the things that they're looking at as it relates to the new builds and anything going forward with this new reality. So I think it's an, a great opportunity for the outdoor spaces and the public areas to really become enhanced. And I think anything else as it relates to technology and technological advances that we can make that help the overall experience are going to really be the winners. Kate, how about you? I know you've been open a while, but operationally and design-wise, did you have to change anything? I mean, you have a lot of um, fun, active food and beverage venues. So how have you redesigned your, your scenario? Great question, Peter. Um, I think we, um, I agree with Carlos 100% on what he said. And, um, you know, first, as a, as a portfolio, we do have a couple projects that are in the pipeline. And so those conversations absolutely are taking place. Um, I, I was with our, we have a property opening in Times Square. Um, and so, you know, we, we absolutely had the conversation with the contractors um, to say in the design firm to say, what do we have to do? What can we do to build in to make those changes? And so a lot of what Carlos said, absolutely spot on. With regards to food and beverage, also totally relevant. Um, and so, you know, a lot of it really boils down to um, spacing. Um, it, as much, you know, as you can make it so that your, um, your permanent spacing is there. Um, buffets, uh, I think you'll probably see um, gone away with. I don't think many places are going to continue to build built-in breakfast buffets. Um, I think that that probably will um, be a trend that was, uh, you know, in the past. Um, and I think um, how space around um, walk-up concessions, food and beverage walk-up concessions are designed will will be considered it, so that it allows for people to continue to maintain their space but still utilize that uh, that great amenity okay very good Stu, any comments on that as you get ready to open yeah um i mean uh, i agree buffets are going to go away um in fact uh most of the major brands uh temporarily stop buffets um so they're, they're going away from that um, we are not going to have um, any meeting space. We're kind of a boutique hotel, but we are. We have a third-party celebrity chef restaurant. Uh, business as usual, planning, um, but there is going to be social distancing implemented um, within the restaurant, and we are looking at some outside venues up on our fifth floor pool deck. Um, but uh, ju just like Carlos said, a lot of open air. Uh, but I will tell you this, that... All the hotels that started construction in the pipeline 
and there's there's a lot in, within Broward County. Um, they're 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 going at full steam ahead. I mean, they really are. So it's good to see that there were no stop orders, even when uh, COVID was at its worst in Florida. Uh, construction was ongoing. I mean, we did see a slowdown because there were less people working. I think we went from at one point we went from 150 people a day a uh, day to 80 people a day. Um, but that's uh, ramped up a lot since then as we get closer. Um, but that's that's why we are um, opening later than anticipated, and I think that'll happen with a lot of people. But yeah, I think buffets are going to go away. Um, no, nobody's going to really feel comfortable even even when there is a vaccine. So interesting. Yeah, yeah cuz a lot of people ask about serve buffets and the cost involved if we kept the equipment but then had to staff it with servers. Joe, you want to comment on that? Yeah, it's interesting. Um as an event designer, I I'm so appreciative of some of our uh partners because what we've also been able to do in this slowdown and in, in the shutdown, um, we've been able to consult with them because we're looking at their space differently because they knew the challenge. Like, we don't have an, out an outlet outside. But if we need to service leisure guests, we've got to figure something out with this space because not all hotels are made the same. Right. And so that has been an interesting uh, challenge for us is to come at it from a, from a design standpoint or can we, because, you know, Realistically, a hotel wants to create revenue. They want to create an, an atmosphere that their guests can eat. But a lot of, you know, existing hotels didn't have outside space to service. Um, so that has been a challenge that we've had on the event design side to come in. Um, uh, it's not our space, and so we're not emotionally as tied to it. So we're, we're honest, we're direct, but, like, there are solutions that can happen. So I think it's a really good question because it is the new norm right now. Um, okay. You know, this... You know, in some restaurants, in hotels, as you know, they've got the buffet set up for breakfast. Like, that's their, that was their, their go-to. And now they can't do that. So that's also something that we've been looking at just from a, a third-party standpoint, just trying to help them consult. Okay. Yeah, and Joe, and Joe uh, it's funny because, uh, you know, your thinking is different now. You look, at, you look at things that you've never thought of looking at before. We were, we were touring our hotel yesterday, and we're just, you know, instead of looking throughout the hotel... We looked outside, and there's a city park right next to us. So we're like, hmm, what would it take to get a uh, permitting to have events right. over there? So the thinking is a lot different than it used to be, and it's going to continue to be like that. Yeah, Bonnie, I'll ask you the same question. I mean, you're in the catering business. What you know? Have you been more creative than useful, or what's your thoughts on this? Well, like I said, the, the, the ability to use social media for social distancing as well has been great for us because, you know, for us dealing with the hospitals when we told them, you know, how we had created the ability for all of the staff members to go ahead and just place their orders in advance on, on our social media privately and be able to have them come downstairs, pick up their order with absolutely no contact whatsoever was a great plus for us. And it was a great plus for them as well. So in that regard, you know, being innovative and obviously thinking out of the box and, and trying to be as creative as possible, those are the things that our clients look to us to be able to say, this is what we've created. This is what we're implementing. These are the safety features. I mean, as a caterer, I'm not a hotel, but we are looked upon as, you know, a company that is innovative, is on the front line of, of bringing in new and exciting things. So being able to do that has been a great plus. Again, yeah, yeah. you know, following all the social distancing and the CDC strict guidelines um, have been a plus for us. And, and people being able to see, you know, what we've done has been very helpful. And, I, you know, as a guest, if I were to use your company, I'd be more talking to you because you're handling my food. So mm -hmm. I'm going to spend more time with the banquet manager, the catering sales manager, etc. All right, we've got just a few more minutes for a couple of questions. Kate wanted me to mention things, other technology things. The, uh, go ahead and talk about it. UV filters, robots, things like that. Yeah, I think, um, you know, what we didn't talk about are some of the structural or the back of the house um, things that will change. Um, a lot of um, thought and a lot of places are incorporating 
um, UV filters, retrofitting their um, HVAC. They are um, incorporating robots, um, which is super cool and super fun. And those, um, those are technologies that hospitals have used. And um, that, that, that language, that coined phrase, hospital grade clean, um, uh -huh. is something you know, that we talk about now. Um, and then also how we design and look at spaces, our, meeting, our back of house spaces where we have our administrative support teams. That's really going to have to be looked at and changed. Um, you know, we, we, that's cyclical where it used to be independent offices, then it yep. moved to sort of that, you know, all shared spaces, that creative war room idea. Um, and now it's going to go back to being a little bit more separate in back of houses. Right. And cleanliness in back of houses has to get attended to equally now. You know, I mean, uh, you know, I'll date myself, but I grew up at a time starting as a dishwasher when I was 14. And if I came with the sniffles, I still was mandated to go to work and work my shifts. Right now, we don't want our associates coming in with any temperature, fever, signs of illness. So these are different things that probably will stay that aren't bad. Um, you know, they're not all bad things. All right, I'm going to close with a question for each of you that's the same question. And um, the way it got to me to be my last question is kind of funny. And uh, this one was kind of the best example of it. I've been in hospitality my whole life. We are caregivers. We love people. We want to be here. One thing I'm seeing during the pandemic that's a little bit disturbing is the lack of transparency. People don't know the answers, and it's okay to be a CEO and say, I just don't know. But I don't see that as much as I would like. I'm, at, I'm attending right now the Asian American Hotel Operators Conference online. One of the speakers said he's all about his associates, it's all he's done, and he laid off 40,000 of his associates. So I have a hard time believing anything. What I would like you to ask the panelists is this one question, and this came up from many others. And I'll start with you, Bonnie, because you're on top of my screen. Thanks. <laughs> should, should we stay in the industry we love, or are these long-term changes where we really should take our skill set and go elsewhere? So should we stay in hospitality because this is our passion, or do you really think these technologies and robots and everything else is really going to shrink us and we should go elsewhere? That is a fabulous question, and I'm so glad that you, you raised this question. So many people have talked about pivoting, educating yourself in doing something different, finding a new field. Hospitality and the live events industry is not going anywhere. This is an amazing, amazing career path for anybody. I've been in this industry for 25 years. I have never seen a more united industry to make things better, to make our clients feel better, to make our peers feel better, to make our competitors feel better. COVID has brought this entire industry together and I think we will absolutely come out of this much stronger, much better, much more knowledgeable and we will be able to handle anything that we go through in the future together. But I would encourage anybody that loves to deal with people, that loves being a people person and, and coming in contact with people at live events, that the this industry is absolutely an industry to move forward with. We have some of the most talented, creative, wonderful people in our industry. And I am I've never been more proud to be part of an industry with all the people that I've gotten to talk to, not only across the United States, but globally, because this is obviously a global issue and the live events industry is global and I think moving forward it's going to absolutely still remain a phenomenal career path for anybody and anybody thinking about leaving it I think they should reconsider and just take that time and think things through. <laughs> I love it. You're so passionate. Kate, how about you? Stay or go? I say stay. I echo Bonnie's sentiment 100%. Um, you know, we will recover, um, and it's an amazing industry, and if it's the right one for you, the right fit, um, then um, stay the course. Okay. Leone, how about you? I agree with both ladies. Uh, definitely stay. 
But I believe as leaders, we have responsibilities as well. Uh, in, in speaking in terms with this individual, we need to build relationships at this time. We, mean, we need to maintain relationships at this time. We need to maintain relationships with our colleagues who are working and laid off. And we are going to eliminate some positions. And we need to um, be transparent. We need to communicate with them. But I also believe we're going to create new positions from this situation. We need to also build relationships with our um, schools. I'm part of. I'm a member of the Academy, Academy of Hospitality and Tourism, where we focus on high schoolers. Um, I've spoken to courses at FA classes at FAU. We need to do more of that because the industry will come back. Um, and it's going to come back bigger and better because, as you all said, there's going to be a flood of individuals who come uh, at our doors, and we have to be ready. <laughs> so, and to be ready, we need to maintain a dialogue with our with our uh, employees. All right, thank you. Joe, so, how about you? I, okay. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> oh, I, I would be remiss to also mention because we're also in a time of uh, racial biases. So we have to think about how can we also integrate uh, black and brown people more into leadership roles as well within our industry. I agree. We have a big diversity initiative right now at FAU. And I've always, you know, one of my favorite places was I, my job was kind of opening new hotels and fixing broken <coughs> ones when I worked at IHD and when I worked for a management company. And I remember being at the Hilton in Deerfield, which is now a double tree. And I had 62 countries represented on my staff. And I just thought that was the most amazing job I ever had because mm -hmm. of the diversity of people. It was just incredible. So I'm with you on that one. Joe, how about you? Stay or go? Well, I, I'll say, you know, I, I work for cruise lines. I work for Pebble Beach Resorts. I work for an incentive house and being an owner of a, an event management company, which um, is purely relationship driven. I mean, that's what is amazing about this industry. I, I don't know how I could go. I don't know how I could advise somebody to go. And I, and I say that because everything I have, my friends, everything I have as far as my family, my travel, my, some of the strongest relationships that I have, and their clients has been through this industry. And I've never forgotten that as times, I mean, you know, in 2008, nine and 10, when we all lived through that. Um, and I said this somebody to yesterday because I am extremely passionate about um, the, the gifts and uh, fruit that comes from this, this, uh, this industry is um, I'm not ready to go anywhere. Like I, I couldn't imagine doing anything else because I think for most people, and I see a lot of shaking heads, we never feel like we're working. You know, when, when there is something about servicing a client or a guest and providing something that they didn't think was possible and then walking away knowing that you've kind of changed them a little bit. You, th there's an experience or something there that they're going to remember when they go back to Ohio or New York or Pennsylvania or wherever. And we're ready when you come back okay. because we're going to do the same thing, if not better. So for me, I, and, I, and I will tell you, there's a lot of people hurting, and I think all of us as leaders need to reach out to some of those because I've had layoffs and furloughs and everything else, but I've never, I, I, the three words that I've been saying more, and I think everybody will, you know, Kate and others will say, I don't know. Those three words I hate saying because of the first time in my business, I don't know. Right. And so I think, uh, but yeah, you got to stay. Because there's so many fruits that are going to come, and we're going to get through this. We're at the tip of the sword of this thing, and we have been. But when we come back, I said this to my colleague yesterday. It's going to be so much fun. I, I know it's going to it's going to be hard, but uh, but I would encourage everybody. You got to stick through it. You're right. going to build character. This is building some character in people that they didn't know they had, and I am very encouraged. So absolutely, you got to stay. <laughs> awesome, thank you, Carlos. How about you? Stay. Uh, I, I love everyone has articulated it beautifully. I will add the words of a great hotelier. You might know him, Conrad Hilton, God rest his soul, 1919. He said this, it has been and continues to be our responsibility to fill the earth with the light and warmth of hospitality. And I think in 2020, it's as true today as it ever that he could have ever imagined in his wildest dreams. And at the end of the day, I think it's not only stay, it's double down. 
It's learn that next segment of the business that maybe you didn't take the time. Branch out because there is no greater business than this in terms of what we get back from it. We give and we receive tenfold. Whether we're in tourism, a DMO, whether we're a DMC, whether we're a hotel executive, an educator, a restaurant, and everything in between our wonderful business, we get to build memories and create experiences every day. So stay, 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 and double down on it. Nice. Tom, how about you? Kind of hard as you get to the end here. <laughs> well, you know what? I, I, without a doubt, stay. You're in this business. You're doing this job because you love it. And the very first time I started working in a hotel many, many years ago, I mean, I've never looked back. I knew that this is what I wanted to do. It was so much fun. And as challenging as it is right now for everybody, you know, it will get better. It takes time. We've been through ups and downs over the years in this business, but without a doubt, stay. And, you know, I, I want to say quickly that, you know, with Remington Hotels, you know, our CEO and president, um, Sloan Dean and COO Stan Kennedy, from the very first week that we had to furlough across the company, thousands of people, they have done a Zoom call every single week so that they're very transparent. All of our furloughed associates know exactly what's happening in the organization. There's been, uh, you know, good news, bad news, but open honesty. And, uh, you know, we, we've got to continue to keep that type of leadership and communication so that the folks that are out there that are contemplating leaving hopefully will not and stay and ride out this tough storm and uh, come back even stronger. Mm, thank you. Stu, how about you? So hospitality is in our blood, right? I mean, I started like you did, Peter. I, I started when I was 16, uh, dishwasher at a Howard Johnson's Plaza Hotel on Long Island. And I think my most exciting day to this date was when I was promoted to busboy. Uh, me too. That was it. <laughs> me yeah. too. So um, <laughs> it's in your blood, and if somebody gets, if, if leadership isn't being transparent, um, that happens in all industry. There's bad leaders. Um, it's in every single industry. You move on, but you stay in the industry. It's in our blood. I'll, I'll, I'll never forget, I was with IHG2 as a franchise property, and, and I'll, always forget, I'll always remember this. Um, it sums up hospitality. I was at a meeting about 18 years ago at the Holiday Inn in Destin, Florida. Great property. And they did an exercise that said, I want everybody to write down, and there's 30 people in the class, I want everybody to write down why they got into hospitality. And they went in the room and they, and they read every answer. And he said, you know what? There's not one answer that says to make a lot of money. And that's what hospitality is all about. It's in your blood. And um, I would say anybody that's getting the hospitality, the friends I've made, the colleagues over the years, um, it, it's a different world. It's, it's, it's not just a job, it's a lifestyle. And I would say stick with it. Uh, we, we've all had that one bad GM, right? And we'll never forget them. And um, I always said that if, you know, if, if somebody leaves me and goes on and gets promoted to even a different company, that's great. I want them to just say that they learned something from me. So hospitality is the best industry in the world, and stick with it. This COVID's not going to be around forever. Great. And Stacy, I'm coming to you last, but on purpose because you have, you know, an esteemed career in public service and only recently came to the visitor side of the business, although you've promoted Fort Lauderdale probably your whole life since living here. So I want to hear your take on the industry. Would you stay now at this point or would you go? Well, you know, Peter, I'm a lawyer, and so I don't want to answer stay or go because I don't want the liability in case someone decides to take advantage of my advice. Um, but I will tell you this. I will tell you this. I, I didn't come through um, hospitality like anybody else on this panel. Um, I started out practicing law, then I did almost 20 years in elected office before I discovered tourism. And I have never had a better time. Awesome. I'm so sorry that I didn't find it earlier in my life. And I'm very fortunate that I get to end my career in hospitality. 
the people <laughs> are the most amazing people I've ever worked with. They are more genuine and more authentic than, well, certainly anybody in politics, but um, <laughs> even, you know, or any lawyer, I guess. Well, I guess there's not much to compare it to in my career. Careful. But, um, it, it has just been, it, why, is there another lawyer on the uh, call? No. It's just been so amazing. Everyone has been, it, everyone is so welcoming. Everybody is so, was so happy to help me when I didn't know something and to answer my questions. So I wouldn't want to leave today for anything, and I am so grateful that I am that I am able to do this um, every single day. I, I will tell you, it was more fun when I had more money to spend. Uh, my budget's been cut like everyone else's, but even during these very, very difficult times, I, I, we work with people who are always upbeat, always want to help, always ready to go above and beyond. I can't tell you how many people at, at Visit Lauderdale have said, how can I help? What can I do? It may not be in my job description, but how can I help us get through this? And as a leader, um, not only do I appreciate that, but I am willing to express my own vulnerability. I awesome. don't have all the answers. None of us has all the answers. And, any of us, and anyone who tells you they do is not telling you the truth these days. And I think leaders need to show that we are people like everyone else. Absolutely. And that there are days that I am struggling just to get out of bed. There are. Um, but you do it and you move on. Certainly there are days I'm struggling to put pants on these days. But, um, <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm wearing pants, so we're good. Uh, but it is the most incredible profession. And I would encourage anybody and everybody who feels like they want to do something greater than themselves to join. Awesome. Well, I, I can't thank all of you enough. I know we went a little over. This will be posted on YouTube, so I'm not as time-focused as I normally am. Um, I, did, I saved the one horrible question about budgets for our next webinar, so you're off the hook a little bit right now because <laughs> we're going into budget time, and I'm sure that upset you not to talk about that. But I can't thank you enough. Bonnie, success with Cafe La Carte. Kate, keep running the great Margaritaville. Leonie, fill those rooms at IHG with a big group coming up soon. Joe, book some business. Carlos, make sure we know when you open. Stacy, keep promoting our primary wonderful spot of Greater Fort Lauderdale. Stu, I expect to see the hotel as soon as it's shiny new. And Tom, if I ever get on a plane again, I'll come to Vegas and say <laughs> hi. So thank Please you do. all, okay? I really appreciate thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.